This is Brian with ScreenFiles.com in review. What I'm looking at today is 2018's Headcount. I actually did a reaction video to this movie and this is the first time I've actually seen it. It appeared on Netflix a few days ago and so I really wanted to look at this. And it's a mixed bag. Let's look at what's really good about it. First off, the photography of this movie is gorgeous. The cinematographer is Sean Bagley and he does wonders with this movie. It looks expensive. Now, that's, now keep in mind, it probably isn't. The special effects are minimal and it revolves around one or two sets. But actually, it revolves around one set. There are other areas, but primarily it's a one set movie. The movie is shot at um, Joshua Tree National Park. When the characters are outside and moving about, it is gorgeous to look at. Even when they're inside this house, the image is so crisp, so sharp. It's almost as if Ridley Scott shot this movie. It's just gorgeous to look at. And that goes a long way to giving it such an increased production value. This is, without a doubt, an expensive looking movie. I'm assuming it was shot on digital, but it looks so beautiful. And I can't repeat how a well shot movie will elevate an entire production. This, as I said earlier, was likely not a very expensive movie, but it looks expensive. It looks rich. Colors pop. It's primarily earth tones, but nonetheless, Everything is rich and beautiful to look at, and it makes it so much more dynamic. And I only wish other relatively low budget movies looked like this one. This movie is just gorgeous. Now let's look at what's not so great about this movie. Unfortunately, the story it revolves around a kind of urban legend type setup, kind of like Slender Man in that there's this demon, this entity called, I believe it's his G, and you have to say it's, you have to say a certain kind of, it's not really a chant, but you have to say these certain things, and you have to say his G five times, and it comes. And it, it's an interesting creature, and it also, oddly enough, has OCD. By which I mean it only does things in fives. And you can tell it's coming if you look around the frame of the film and you see things happening in fives. It's really actually a clever idea. But like a lot of ideas in Headcount, it's not taken to its fullest potential. So I actually watched this movie twice because there are lots of interesting little details. And again, the five motif is so important to the progression of this movie. And you see it everywhere in the frame. It's such a great idea. But as I said, it's not carried to its logical conclusion. For instance, one of the attributes of the his G, the creature, is that it takes the appearance, the form of someone close to you. So at various times of the movie, you're seeing the his G, but you don't know it. It's made apparent though. It's, again, it's clever in that respect as well. But the thing is, we don't know who these characters are. The story essentially revolves around these two brothers who are estranged for various reasons. And they get together every, I think it's every year it feels like. And one of them lives in Joshua Tree National Park. They meet these other people. One brother leaves, one stays with the people. And weirdness ensues. Now the thing is, we don't know who these people really are, and they're given no depth, and the movie isn't really about them. They seem to be in the movie for things to happen too, and that's fine, but the thing is, the conceit the movie works with, namely that the his G looks like someone you're familiar with, 
doesn't really work as effectively as it could because we're not invested in these characters. We don't really know them. They don't have any depth to speak of. And that's not to say they're not well acted. This entire movie is very well acted. It's very naturalistic and everyone is bringing their A-game to this, but they're just not giving much to work with. So there are, no, there are very few characters, actual people in this movie. There are people to have things happen to. And unfortunately, that's what's mainly the case in this movie. They're just props to have things happen to. So therefore, when those things do happen, there's little resonance. And as I said earlier, since the conceit of this movie is that the his G looks like someone in your company, you don't know these people. Therefore, it doesn't really matter. It's interesting when you see it happen, but it's not terribly scary because they appear in a circumstance which is very naturalistic and they're very, they seem comfortable there. So it's not strange. And this is something that could have been easily remedied. For instance, if you've seen John Carpenter movies, particularly I'm thinking of The Thing and In the Mountain of Madness, there were scenes when a creature would cross the camera very quickly and it would just be a shadow. That was effective because you didn't know what it was. All you knew it was, it was something vaguely human. That's it. You had no idea what that was. Or for instance, have someone just stand in the background. Just the camera pans, there's a person in the background, and move on. It's, it would be unsettling. This movie doesn't do that. It's, it could use more ominousness. It's odd in the sense that it seems to be trying to set up an atmosphere, but it doesn't help itself to do that very task. So, and for instance, let me give you an example of how this, how as it's established in the movie, it doesn't work. There's a scene where I want to say four, three or four characters are playing a game and the camera is panning back and forth. They're sitting across from me. No, they're actually sitting like in a row. At least visually, it looks like a row. So the camera is panning back and forth, back and forth. It does this like, I want to say four or five times and it creates an expectation that something's going to happen and something does happen by the way but it's so underwhelming and so just not very satisfying that it, it's just it's almost anticlimactic which is odd because the camera moving back and forth back and forth back and forth builds up a tension which is just dissipated so weird and the thing is having seen that scene it's so easy to see how it could have been more effective for instance i mentioned that the camera is moving back and forth between these three or four characters as they have a conversation and play this drinking game or actually i don't think it's a drinking game but they play this game in any case the camera is moving back and forth back and forth so why not have a character just appear in the distance. In one scene, camera pans, he's there. Camera pans back, he's there. Camera pans again, he's gone. Just something to let the viewer know something truly ominous is happening here. And so there are lots of moments like that where opportunities to build tension and atmosphere are squandered and it's really odd thinking as i was watching this movie is that typically movies are made from the perspective that you're not present as a viewer which makes sense because you're not but there's a character who typically will act as an in for you who will give you perspectives and insights as if you were there Headcount doesn't do that. Again, it's really odd. So you're not only not terribly familiar with who these characters are, but 
you're viewing them as if you should know things that you can't know because you weren't told. So it's a very unsatisfying movie, which is a pity because as I said, it's gorgeously shot. It's remarkable to look at. It has very good sound design, but the story lets it down. And speaking of the story letting it down, a whole chunk of the movie is dedicated to the relationship between these two brothers, which does not play a role in the movie. I mean, it's their characters react to it, oftentimes mockingly, but it serves no purpose to the narrative. It doesn't further the story at all. If, if for instance, you took away that entire brother relationship from this movie, it would change nothing because it's just not essential. It sets it up, the movie opens actually on one of the brothers leaving school to visit Joshua Tree National Park to see his brother. And there's no point to it. Why, I mean, it's mentioned earlier in the movie that their parents are killed and the brother who lives in Joshua Tree cares for the younger brother. So what? What is the point of this? Why is this in the story? It doesn't add any richness to it. It gives us background on these two characters, but the characters, one of them is barely in the movie, and that relationship does not play a role in what precedes it. It doesn't seem to determine the main brother's actions in any meaningful way. It's just there. And as I said earlier, the writing undermines this story. And this is an example of it. That brother, this relationship between these two individuals was not essential to the plot that I could tell. They didn't need to be there. Didn't need to have two brothers. You could literally have a guy visiting Joshua Tree National Park, meets these people, joins their group, weirdness ensues. Because the relationship between, in fact, I would argue that that would have potentially have been a better movie because it would have rid us of that relationship that was serving no purpose. It's a confounding movie and I would probably watch Headcount again. It's interesting. It's visually gorgeous, but it's perplexing because if it had just been perhaps rewritten again, it could have been something really interesting and creepy and in the vein of an Ari Asher movie. He's the director who did Hereditary and Midsummer. As it stands, it's interesting to watch, but it's just not very good. Lots of great intentions amounting to very little. This is Brian with ScreenFault.com and Review. Peace.